reading and studying, I see a desperate need amongst God's people. We're, we're either one of two categories here. We're either stretched out real thin or we're not doing anything. It just kind of, um, we need somehow to balance these things out. Perhaps this is the need of holiness groups beyond just the Indian people. There's a few of us that work and pray, but not enough. Some of the more able, more capable, they're, they're guys that are just a lot quicker than I am and got more on the ball. Sometimes I'm a half court low, bordering on a whole court low, but... Uh, I trust the Lord, and He evidently uh, makes up for it. And so we'll be talking about Christ and leadership, Jesus and His disciples, as we uh, go through the study. And I'll be into the Gospels for the most part uh, in these lessons. But this morning, before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, in Jesus' name we bow. We thank You for the opportunity to serve You. We appreciate the day that conviction came to our hearts and brought us to a place of repentance and then to salvation. We're thankful for the time that you brought us to an awareness of deep needs and a need uh, for the work of cleansing. And we're glad, Lord, for the work of the Spirit this morning. Um, And then, Lord, we appreciate that you found a place for us to labor to find our way, to bring others in as well, to honor God, to glorify Thee. Help us now in this morning's message, lesson, and as we go through the other days, Lord, we're trusting in You, not of ourselves, but in Thee. We find our sustenance, our guidance, our leadership. Lord, we thank You for what You've done for us daily, but we need more. We're looking for uh, another day, Lord, a bigger, brighter day, uh, but a more troublesome day, a more complicated day, uh, a day of increasing pressures, and we need Thee. So help us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we want to talk about some basic ingredients. Matthew chapter 28, and jumping off from the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In today's world, Christians are going to have to rise up. They're going to have to rally. They're going to have to get ready. Um, Get ready for what? I used to hear it said this way, get ready for judgment. You say, oh, we're Christians. We don't don't have to face judgment. No, not so much for ourselves, but we will have to live in the atmosphere where judgment is being meted out. And uh, we... We will live in a world more increasingly so, full of people who have no time for God, full, they, full of people who have no time for the Bible, full of people who are no longer developing their designs and plans and schemes and programs from biblical principles but they are following their own misguided opinions, um, following things that are not of God. And so it's going to require God's people individually to rally themselves, uh, to pull around themselves all of God that they can get. Rise up and be counted. I've often wondered how the Lord was able to do that from such uh, rough, tough characters like the disciples were. Uh, they were so rough, they probably looked like barnacles. Have you ever seen a barnacle? I have never seen them, but I've seen pictures of barnacles, and they look rough, like a tree trunk, all gnarled up. We have cedar trees out in New Mexico and Arizona. They're just little squatty, rough-looking things. And I pictured the disciples that way at times. Uh, how was the Lord able to take individuals like that and uh, make them into the foundation for the church that would uh, bring a revolution to the world, so to speak. But uh, it's because he put things into them and developed them in ways in which they could rise up, regardless of the situation and occasion, be counted and carry out the responsibilities that God wanted to accomplish in them. Today, 
man is making the rules. And you got to be careful about that. Man is making the rules and setting the qualifications for what is important. The Lord, that was one of the first things he did, was he helped them to realize who was making the rules, who set the standard, and what was really, truly important. And I want to read another scripture at this time, over in the um, book of Luke, <clears throat> no, pardon me, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, before we go too far here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left their ship and their father, and followed him. So, the Lord's right now in a process. Now, he's already been ministering a little while here, but he's beginning to pick out, to choose these individuals that he is going to build that tremendous organization, the church. So, nevertheless, in spite of man making the rules, God is still on the throne. God is still reaching out and choosing individuals today. I have to remind myself of that because all the rules that we, you and I, live under and all the rules that tell us what you're qualified for and what you're not qualified for can cause you to get lost. And I'll try and make myself clear here as we go along. God has a solution to man's problems. Not all of man's problems um, are such to where man can figure them out on his own. Sin, for instance. Man cannot deal with his guilty past. God knows that. Mankind has forgotten that. How can a man handle the uncertain future? How can he handle even the perplexing present? He's having a problem with that. I wonder about that, what we just got passed through the, the high Congress. We're, we're looking for a new day, it's what they tell us. The solution to our financial economic problems is come. And if you believe that, stand up and say hallelujah. <laughs> well, I, evidently I'm the only one standing and I can't say hallelujah. <laughs> Man can't handle his problems, but God has a solution for the day. I'm confident of that. We get so occupied competing in man-made arenas, and our vision of Christ's purpose and sufficiency gets clouded. This is why that we want to talk about these things we're talking about here. It's necessary for God's people to be totally, completely convinced that following Jesus is the right and true way and that you can find personal fulfillment and you can also find salvation for your family members and friends and the people that you minister to. Be convinced of that. We can get our vision of the Lord clouded when we begin to look at the rules that are being set around us. Um, well, you're not qualified unless you have a certain amount of degrees. Uh, working among our people, unless you have a degree in something, you can't hardly get a job except to uh, shovel garbage. I think they're looking more and more for qualified people. Qualified by who? Qualified by man. You see, man's making the rules today for the most part, but uh, he's only making them in certain arenas. He hasn't made the whole standard of life and living and purpose in eternity. God made and set all that, and he established that. But mankind is stepping in now more and more, and he's making more and more qualifications for himself. And unless you understand what we're talking about and understand your own relationship with the Lord, you're going to wonder if you're even qualified to do what you do as a Christian. We will have brought down upon us more and more laws and situations that will tell us what you can and cannot do as a child of God. Man making the rules outside of God is going to eliminate God. But when God is in control, he brings people to God, brings them to himself in a more fuller and a greater way. God-given talents and God-given training are adequate for man's needs. Amen. 
Well, I didn't always know that. That's because I'd been listening to the educational system. The educational system said, graduate from high school and go to a college or university for four years and then get a master's and then go out and get a job and become successful. That's what they taught us. That's what they teach. I hear people coming out of these places all the time. That's what they've been taught. They've had to sort their way through these systems in order to find their way for the objective which they were after. Lest you lose that vision of Christ, you need to be on guard, watching. Understand fully that God-given talents, God-given training is adequate for man's needs. I have to wrestle with that. You know, God showed me something peculiar here not too long back. I was riding down the road. I'd been needing an answer on a situation. And... Uh, didn't have anything to do with remaining a Christian. It just had to do with some other issues, like what we're talking about here. And the Lord broke in upon me that day and very clearly revealed to me that if I'll follow Him completely and totally, He would take care of me, He would use me, and He would help me to get done everything that I needed to get done according to His qualifications. You know what that means? That means that even though my relatives tell me, hey, you're, you're in the wrong work. What you need to do is go get an education. You're, uh, you're kind of wasting your time. What you need to do is learn something to make a gob of money. You're wasting your time here. Don't you know that uh, people don't believe that way anymore except for certain little uh, cults and groups? Don't you know that uh, those things are outdated? You need to get in step with the times. In spite of all that we're hearing and the pressures that are upon us, God reassured me that following Him was right and true and that I could be fulfilled and fulfill His uh, requirements as well. That just encouraged me. I just kind of gritted my teeth again fresh and new and doubled my fist and said, we're moving on. Praise God. If our personal value system is correct, then the height of educational attainment is a thorough development by God if we will dedicate ourselves to His mastery. I know we don't want to hear that today because we're so consumed in the qualifications that man says that we have to have. And don't misinterpret anything that I say as a downer on anybody pursuing further knowledge. You have an objective, you need to pursue it, but do so with an eye on Christ confident in where you are with him. But uh, more and more, we're being told that educational attainment, the height of learning, is not in the church. It's not in the things of the Lord. It's definitely not among those perfectionists who believe in being sanctified. Definitely not among that group that dresses different and acts different and abstains from a lot of other things in this world. You're not going to learn anything. You're going to get narrow-minded. You're going to lose your way. You'll be left behind. Well, so be it. God told us, and He exemplified it over and over. As you read the Scriptures, you see where God took these humble, unlearned, unkempt. They probably stunk like fish, some of them. And fish stink, believe me, when they've been laying around a while. And uh, here they were, kind of looking the situation over, and the Lord said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Very powerful statement um, as we get into it a little more. If we dedicate ourselves to His mastery, Jesus will accomplish for us what He accomplished with the twelve. How did Jesus transform the twelve so that they could transform the world? I've asked that lots of times, wondering, what did the Lord do with those guys? I work with people like that. Fact is, I was people like that. How could the Lord take an individual like myself and do what he did? Well, I'm trying to understand that. How did he do that with the twelve? Those are questions that I ask myself going into this. How did he put together a team with a single eye and a cause who before that had no greater purpose but to catch a bunch of big fish? How was he able to develop in them the desire to go forth and win souls? Good question. If we could learn that, perhaps we could begin to see the kind of progress that we pray for and that we desire. We often pray for revival. I tell some of our missionaries, folks, you're praying for a revival. You better get ready. You better get prepared to handle them when they come then. You're not prepared to handle ten converts. Ten converts will wipe you out. You know how much time two converts takes? Lots of time. I think about uh, some of the folks that helped me when I first got saved, how much of their time I took, all nights. 
And uh, poor Sister Gall, she'd wake up all, she wouldn't wake up, she was already up. Bleary-eyed, she had taken the time to help the new boy. She had taken the time to help him to learn something about Christianity. Well, the Lord had to help these twelve. He had to give them time. He had to give them involvement in order for them to get to the place to where they could develop that single eye, that purpose and cause. He had to be involved with them. He had to give them a definite purpose and so that they would develop to the point of devotion to Christ and have the motivation to be able to follow through after he was gone. We develop too many dependents. Individuals who are dependent on us to have to be there all the time, all the time. The Lord was looking from day one with his disciples to get them to a point to where when he was gone, and it was already planned, he was going to be gone in just a few years, he was getting them to a point to where they could go ahead and take off and do everything that needed done. And he put together a tremendous team. He built in them the ability to influence others and lead them in the true way. Are you developing your Christianity in, with that in mind? Do we develop our righteousness so that others can follow us? Do we develop our ministries so that others can get involved in it and follow the way? I've seen a good number of God's people through the years. The ones that are the most successful are the ones that are developing their Christianity and their ministries so that others can get in and follow them and do better than them. Very simple, isn't it? He built in them the ability to influence others and lead them in the true way. Christ instilled. Maybe, maybe I better say it this way. There might be some computer freaks in here. He programmed principles into them. And maybe you understand it better that way. But Christ developed in them principles, just like we do with our children. He was working on these guys, principles in them, and then developed them into a level of efficiency that he was convinced would get the job done, that he needed done. So first of all, he put the principles in them, then he developed them through practice over and over and over and over and over, over and over and over. He was working on uh, things like humility, uh, things like uh, initiative, uh, motivation. He was working on things like righteousness and purity, helping them understand principles and then giving them the practice to do it. That verse we read there, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. As a Christian, as God's person, as an individual who is totally in His hands. That's what saved and sanctified means. I guess we all know that and take that for granted. We teach what we know and we reproduce what we are. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. He knew what He was talking about and He taught them to do what He did. We teach what we know, we reproduce what we are. If the people that follow us our youth and young people, our converts, if they are not producing what we are preaching and telling them to, chances are it's because we're not doing it. We're saying it, but we're not doing it. I think of that often. I uh, look at uh, individuals and wonder, well, why aren't you doing any better than that? My wife, sometimes she's a great motivator. She says, um, well, you know, you don't do so hot yourself. <laughs> what? Who are you? <laughs> You're three years younger than me. You're not submissive. <laughs> but anyway, we talk about that once in a while. And uh, I'm called upon not only to, to say and to do, do the talking, but to be able to do what I'm saying. So then, what does that mean? That means sometimes we'll have to back off everything we're saying a little bit and catch up with what we're actually doing. And then bring those two into harmony and develop them for our people. Those individuals that are listening to us that we're influencing are going to be exactly pretty much as we are. Variations, of course. We must, first of all, have and be an effective model to observe, to emulate. An effective model. An effective model is an individual, of course, that is not afraid to go out and proclaim what they're believing. And then not afraid to back it up. But uh, like Paul said this, it almost sounds like he's boasting. He says, why don't you go out and do like I'm doing? And uh, I think about that as well. Can I say that? Go out and do what I'm doing? I can say that perhaps in certain areas. But what about the complete spectrum? What about in the overall area? I say, well, you know, my marriage isn't so hot. I, don't, I wouldn't want you to follow that. 
A lot of marriages, I definitely wouldn't want to model mine after theirs either. She beats him with an ugly stick every day. Or he thumps on her. It works both ways. Well, definitely an area that it's not uh, right up. But he's a good preacher. Got a good preacher friend. Well, he's not a good friend, but he's a preacher friend. He can really preach. <laughs> it's not that I don't want it to be. I'd like to be, but he won't let me. He can really preach. But this guy is so hard in dealing with people, he undermines every bit of good that he says. What he's saying and what he's doing aren't going together. He's not an effective model. He's a model, but he's not an effective one. Here's where Christ uh, comes in and reveals to us the, uh, what do you call it, the perfect model of effectiveness in doing what he does, in trying to help us to follow him. He's a perfect model to observe, to emulate, to observe. I think the last time we were here, we talked about the matter of looking at Jesus and seeing in him the model of everything that we need and ought to be. And here again, we're looking at one who can model for us the qualities, the traits, and the things that we need. We often are not so much watching him as we are watching one another. The second thing that we need to understand along with we need to have a model and must be a model to observe and emulate, we must have principles with which to build upon. So we need to teach. The Great Commission said something about teaching. wonder why he didn't use the word preaching. I wondered about that. But he said teaching. Well, there's, of course, a lot of things in that scripture, but I like the way that it's, uh, it's rendered to us. I like the idea that I get when I read that. He says, go out and teach them. In other words, model for them, lead them and guide them and help them understand. Instill in them principles and then help them practice those principles so they can go out and do what I have done and what I've taught you to do. Go out and do that. Instill in them. Christ possessed both and he gave both. He's very qualified to say, I will make you fishers of men. I said, well, I don't want to be fishers of men. I want to do something greater. Tell me what's greater than being fishers of men. One of the, one of the overriding reasons that I still preach, and I'm convinced that it's the way because there were people I looked to who their whole purpose in life was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to teach people about holiness, and to lead them in the best the way as they could. Mo many of us are here simply because there were people who did that. That was all they did. That was their main purpose. That were their whole focus. That was their whole attention. They left off other pursuits. They left off other uh, walks of life, careers, money, positions. They left all those to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for the sake of their soul's salvation. And we looked and we, th we said, because it was being um, modeled before us, that's important. That must be important. It must be important if these intelligent individuals give their whole life for the sake of preaching the gospel and teaching people about Jesus. Great results do not always have to come from those who qualify by man's designed recognitions. By man's designed recognitions. I heard a preacher some years back anyway, I don't know how long ago, he said, a lot of people miss the way when they begin to reach out for the recognition that man gives them and they begin to lose their way. Great results are not restricted to those who are greatly qualified by man's standards. God, in using these twelve that He chose, He showed us that He could take ordinary individuals and uh, through a process of development, bring them out ready to face the fire, the flood, the opposition. He brought them out with thorough training, able to teach people to do what they do, teach people to do what he did. He brought them out. They were qualified to go out and bring many people in. Did they bring a lot of people in? Of course they did. We bring people in and we try to get them educated within the first few weeks. I know we've missed our way a lot of times with individuals. Fact is, I think a few times we tried to educate them in everything while they were praying at the altar. And uh, half the time they didn't even know what they were seeking for down there. God can qualify us to be great, to bring, many, to bring many souls to Himself. God can qualify us. That's not hard to understand. The Apostles, Luke chapter 6. 
he, I appreciated the way that the, the Bible brings this out. Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, And it came to pass in those days he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. There was a number of disciples, a number of disciples that he had following him. Of course, he was a man of influence. He was practicing what he was going to teach. Jesus was doing what he needed his disciples to do. He started out his ministry and he began to develop influence immediately. As soon as he was able to uh, begin to, well, it was an early age, just a boy, he was already in the temple developing, working, developing influence that he knew he needed to have in order to get to a point to where he could train some other people in those same dynamics and then they could go out and train other people. Our style oftentimes is get them saved and then get them through at least to a professed sanctification and say, go get them. You know, the last lesson we'll have here has to do with Pentecost. That's where we'll finish. We'll finish these lessons with Pentecost, that uh, great seal that Christ gave to the apostles. But there's a whole lot before that that took place. And we often, our expectations of those that we're preaching to and trying to teach are much higher than reality dictates. Well, it's taken a long time for us to get where we are. I'm sure you probably feel that way. Maybe you might have more on the ball than a lot of others and me, but I know what it's taken to get me to where I'm at. It was a hard pull. It was a hard push. And... Uh, I don't, I, had, I don't think I'm arrived yet. I'm confident I haven't arrived. And you maybe feel that way too. But in this beginning here, where the Lord uh, took time, He went and prayed, and then He came, gathered His disciples, and from out of that, evidently a large group, He picked out twelve. He'd already been kind of working on them already anyway when He was out by the seashore there, calling them here, calling them there. He let them mingle with the group for a while. And then he reached in and began to pick out these individuals, seeing in them the things that he was going to be able to develop into a dynamic team. Looking out across individuals like this, there's individuals probably with potential unrealized. You can do far greater things than you're actually doing this morning. God help us. The apostles were important to Christ. The apostles' importance to Christ did not depend on the qualifications that man says are a priority. When the Lord looked out across that group of disciples and He picked out these individuals evidently for qualifications that uh, were other than what the ruling government was saying was what you needed, what the educational system said you needed, what the, uh, the union, the workforce said you had to be, what the philosophers and what the priests and, and what the country folk were saying you needed to be. He looked out across there and he saw in them the things that he needed in order to take them out and teach them and develop them to be what they were going to be. They did not qualify according to man's standards except in their own little arenas. If they were fishermen, they might have been real good fishermen. Good tax collectors, they might have been a real good tax collector. They might have been good in their fields, but that's not why the Lord chose them as such. He had other and deeper reasons for choosing them. God had to take and give these individuals an increasing sense of their own importance to Him. Note that. Not an increasing sense of importance in and of itself in them for them, but importance about them for Him, to Him. To himself, he is always drawing individuals and bringing people. Christ said, to have influence, you have to be able to get followers and teach them. It tickles me when I see someone get up, a professed leader, and they tell you how to do it and tell you what to do, but they don't have anybody following them. And the ones they did have following them gave up on them. The ones they could have aren't ever going to because the longer they're in, the worse they get. Jesus said that if you're going to get followers, you're going to have to learn how to do that, and I'll teach you how to do it. You follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. You follow me, and I will help you to draw out from the fabric of this society that you and I live individuals who will completely astound you for what they can do for the Lord. We haven't yet seen what God can do in our world totally. 
We've seen lots of what he can do. Wouldn't you like to see more of that? I think to myself, Lord God, if you can do that, please do. We need more Indian preachers. The ones that we have are few. The ones we had are gone. Gone, why? Because the man designed qualifications out there said, hey, you're worthless where you are. Come and join us. Had a ex-preacher's wife say to my wife, no, say to another preacher's wife who conveyed it to my wife, just leave that out. It's a hindrance to you. This way of holiness, the church, it's a hindrance to you. Leave it out and come with me. I'll show you what you can really get out of life. That's a real tricky thing today. I didn't know, I didn't know it was such a problem until I watched a number of people begin to go that way. Where they're listening to the voice that is saying, hey, what you're doing here in this camp meeting is a waste of time. It's not going to fit in the new world that's coming. We already knew that, didn't we? We already knew it wasn't going to fit. And we already decided we're not going to fit. We've already made up our minds we don't want to fit. The challenge we have on our hands is to bring some others in who feel the same way, who see it the same way, and who are ready and willing to live and perhaps die that way as well. The Lord God looking on these apostles, these twelve, He says, all right, boys. And He knew they were going to give their lives in the end. He had to get them ready for that. And you and I have a task on our hands. Um, we, many of us, are not even ready for that ourselves. I'll tell you, man makes the rules. I think about that at times when we're working among our people. They're sometimes bewildered at some of the regulations and the rules and the requirements that society places on its people, our American society. But I thought about it one time after I'd heard some these opinions, and I said, well, that's the way it's going to be. The dominant people have made the rules about how you're supposed to live in this, this country, this society. And if they made the rules, they're going to make the rules in such a way to where they can live up to those rules and make it. It don't matter what anybody else can or can't do, you'll have to come up to their rules because they made the rules. So therefore, uh, they say, well, do you have a title to the land? The Indians have never thought much about titles to land. They say, well, don't you know the laws? A lot of Indians don't know the laws about that. Their lands are separate. They don't pay taxes on them. And uh, they just don't. It's recorded in their record systems what land is whose, what goes where, the inheritance of it all. There's not really any titles on a lot of Indian land. So they don't understand that. It's a new rule to them for many of our people. But when they get out of that frame, they get out of that little society, that reservation, they run into those laws and they say, why? This is new. Where'd this come from? I said, well, white men made the rules this way. And this is what you have to do if you're not going to live here. You're, if you're going to live out here, you've got to live by these rules because they made the rules. And if you're going to make it, here's what you have to do in order to make it. So, okay, I begin to catch on. And so they have a lot to learn in that way, a lot of them coming out. Well, we're living in a, a world and a day where man has made the rules. And he's making the rules more strict and more strict and more strict and more strict. And they're away from God increasingly so. The laws are getting such to where we are going to be required legally to go against what God's Word teaches us. We're approaching it very quickly where we will be required by the law to stand against, to practice the things that God's Word says are wicked, are evil. We cannot support that. We're already paying taxes into a system that is using those monies to do dastardly, evil, and wicked things. It's a, it's a borderline situation now as to how our money is being spent and the things that it's funding. It's a shocking situation out in our world today. When I was up in Canada uh, not too long back, some folk were telling me, they said, you know something? There's an art display down here in the city of Calgary that is the most vile that they'd ever seen. It depicts the twelve apostles. They were made into male sexual organs in this picture at the Last Supper. I thought, man, I just, I still can't get over that. I hate to even say it here, but I want you to get the, the weight of this thing. It just still shocks me. I just can't imagine somebody sinking so low and getting so dark and so far away from God that they would take that 
uh, that time, that event, a special event, sacred, and picture it so vile. Think about that a little bit. Oh, yes, we're coming to a time when the qualifications, the rules that man is setting, is going to require you and I to say, this is as far as I go. This is as far as I go. Unless you're well acquainted with the author of your salvation, you'll not be able to take that stand. You'll not be able to stand up and be counted unless you can do that. Unless you're confident in the one who called you out from among them to be his child. Well, Christ's involvement is such to where he wants to help us to get to that place. He involves himself with his people. Too many times man settles for a title, a position, and he proceeds to perform for people instead of train them. I never knew that. But often when we're preaching, I forget that I'm going to have to help somebody who will ask me, how do you do that? Well, boy, I don't know. I'd be a poor teacher, wouldn't I, if I taught something and then someone come up and said, well, how can I do that? So, Man, you know, really, I don't know. I don't know how you do that. Let's go ask somebody <laughs> to teach us how to do that. We would ought to be able to train them to do. We're actually doing more performing than anything else. Why is that? Our involvement, our involvement with our people isn't to the degree to where they are learning to carry on the necessary things. We entertain them every Sunday. We preachers entertain on Sundays. The singers entertain. The song leaders entertain. The specials. Even the offertory is entertaining. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not making fun. I want us to understand something here. There is an old form of looking at leadership, and then there is Christ's way of looking at leadership. Christ's way of uh, dealing and developing leadership was to get these guys to a point to where they could reproduce themselves in their people, not merely entertain them and make dependence out of them. We too often make people who are dependent upon us. They're dependent on us to be there. They're dependent on us to say the things that we say. They're dependent on us to carry them. fact is, most of the time, they're dependent on us to do the evangelism. They're dependent on us to go out there and win the souls. We're, we're making people that are dependent on the preachers to win the souls. When actually those individuals that are following the preachers ought to be out there perhaps winning more souls than the preacher himself. And we lose our way. I'm, I'm really uh, preaching to myself here as I'm into this because I have to work with people and manage people. But I don't want to just be a manager. I don't want to just be someone who teaches them about the rules of the organization, the rules of the mission, or those kind of things. I want to be able to help them to say, come on, let's go get them. Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Let's go. And he took them and away they went. Not too long after that, you find him giving them some assignments. After he had already, after he had already shown them how to do it, he says, all right, boys, we're going to divide you up two by two. And we're going to get you together to go out there. You're going to work together. You're going to cast out demons. You're going to heal people. You're going to tell people to repent and come to me. You're going to point them to God. Here you go. You've been watching me do this. Now go out and practice what you've been observing. Come back and tell me about it later. And away they went. Maybe a little frightened. Maybe a little optimistic. But away they went nevertheless. The Lord Jesus Christ was not content to be a performer. We many times stop right there. We're a Christian performer. We lead the Bible study and uh, we're the performer. Get the people to get to the point to where they can do the Bible study. Do the Sunday school. Get them to the point to where they rise up and they say, you know, the Lord's been talking to me about missions. I haven't been doing anything. But God wants me to start something from nothing. We don't always have to be in a place that's already all set up. You might ask, you, you might say, well, preacher, tell me, when was the last time you started something? That's why I'm studying this. That's why I'm studying this. I don't want to just be a performer. I don't want to be an entertainer. I want to be able to preach and teach and help individuals rise up and to do. What did he say? You'll do more than these. You'll do what I've done and more, the Lord told them. I would much rather be overshadowed left on the back seat. I think it was Brother Yoder mentioned something to me last year or year before. 
he brought a little saying to me. We was into a certain subject and he says, you know, I've heard it this way. He says, if you can't run with the big dog, stay on the porch. Well, Brother White and I were in a camp meeting here together and we laughed about that all week long. And uh, bringing it down to right now, I would honestly love to see some of our Indian people, some of the other people we preach to, rise up and porch me so bad. I'll go find some other people to preach and teach and make some more big boys. I'll tell you, the Lord was interested in developing individuals and giving to them a sense of their importance to Him. Do you have a sense of your importance to the Master? When He chose out the disciples, He says, You, you. And um, if the Lord were to be here looking at all these disciples and He points to you, we'd get to me? Oh, no, no. Not me, not me, not me. Lord says, you, you, yeah, you right there in the blue. Quit hiding. As he looks out, he brings this thing. He really brings it home. When he's uh, talking here, he takes and he prays about it through the night. And then he comes and he picks out 12 individuals. I don't know about those 12, but if it was me and the Lord walked in and says, I need 12 men. Brother, whoo. <laughs> but he has to, he has to he instill in them the sense of their importance to Him. And in the process of them being important to Him, they realize, you know something? I do have a place. My place in Him is where I find my sense of worth and importance. And that's the, that's the first great ingredient that He had to get them to understand first. If they were ever going to go out and shake the world, and shake their part of the world, they were going to have to know that they were special to the Master, and that was the basis of their devotion. The foundation of their devotion was in this that we're talking about right here. Well, why else would they be willing to die unless they knew they were special to the Master? They knew that He had gone to prepare a place for them, they knew that He would be with them all the way to the end. I'm with you always. Clear to the end. You can count on Me. The foundation of that devotion, that motivation to go out and do what they needed to do, came from that sense of importance that the Lord gave them. It's a basic seed. We can love people and not lead them. But you can't lead people without loving them. And so in this, as he reached out and he took these individuals, he began an involvement with them, a love life with them, a love relationship with those individuals, whereby when it came down to it, after that period of training, they were rooted, they were grounded, and he sent the Holy Spirit to seal the situation. I'll tell you what, there was a devotion there that even, uh, even when the Lord told some of them how they were going to finish up life, didn't shake them. He says, you're going to be run out of synagogues, beat. You'll be persecuted. I'm with you. Even when they failed, they failed miserably. And when the Lord just reached out to him yet and told him, hey, you're still special to me. You're still special to me. I still want you. They came back and it just more and more powerfully nailed those things down deep into the warp and woof of their being. So when it came down to it, folks, they were ready. They knew they were special to the Master. You can love people and not lead them, but you can't lead them without loving them. Those things go together. Jesus gave the apostles worth and hope that they could be what He was saying they could be. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, 19 there, you find that hope that He built into them referred to uh, when He was talking to Peter there. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He began to build into them the expectation that they could get the job done. There, the sense of their importance in Him had to be built, instilled, and then developed. Peter wasn't a rock at this time, but neither are we when we get our beginnings. Man, we're not even a pebble when we get started. 
I just banged around out there serving the Lord. Didn't amount to anything. But the Lord wasn't worried about that. If I stayed in Him, He could use me. As you have stayed in Him, He can use you. He gave them a sense of their potential, their greatness. He told Peter, Peter, kind of an impulsive guy at times, uh, he looking on the situation, he says, Oh no, I could never be that way. I could never be a soul winner like that. He says, Peter, I want to tell you something. I know some things about you, and if you'll let me do with you what I can do, I'll make you a rock. You guys will be foundations, the keys to the kingdom in your hands. You stick with me. I will make you fishers of men. The Lord bless you. You pray for us as we carry on these lessons.